Good evening, all. Um, my name is Sari. I'm a lawyer. I'm a professor. I teach in uh, San Luis. I teach um, intellectual property rights and media law. And tonight I'm here to talk to you about GDPR, big data. Perhaps a quick round in the room. Um, could you quickly present yourselves and just say what, what business you're in, what type of profile you have to have, a technical profile, business profile, legal, um, and the type of business you're in? Yeah? Consultants, and that helps me to finance my startup that is uh, related basically social media with a lot of content. So, this doesn't be high. Yeah, wonderful. <coughs> Hello, Ludovic. I'm a data scientist. I'm a more uh, RD stuff. Uh, more RD work. Okay. I'm um, York, and I'm a, a corporate lawyer. Okay. Quite important, yeah. Wonderful. I'm a student, I'm a social scientist in San Luis and I work in banking. In? Banking. banking. Hi, I'm Nacho. I'm a software engineer um, developing web uh, applications. Okay, technical, more technical profile, yeah? Yeah. I'm Jonathan Romero, I work as an IT project manager. Okay. Banking as well. Marketing. Marketing. Hi, I'm Dennis Paul. I'm a startup founder. Uh, I'm non technical, commercially oriented, and uh, my startup is a sports app. So I'm interested in the management of user data and also referral data. Mm -hmm. People have wanted to refer their friends. Right. Yeah. Invite your friends to yeah. like this stuff. Yeah. Friends, hey. yeah, yeah. Okay. From my basic reading, Something like GDPR is very restrictive on those types of things, which is a shame. We'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, so what we're going to do today, brief introduction, so we're going to situate a little what we're talking about, really, because we have, well, all of you have quite different backgrounds, so I think it's quite useful to, to, to start very broadly. Hi. Uh, so quite broadly and, uh, and, and see several applications. It's a small group, so if you have any questions, if you have any observations, if you have any useful uh, experience to share, do not hesitate. Huh? Uh, I think it will be uh, the richer for your contributions. First question that we should ask always when uh, dealing with legal matters is, does the law actually apply? And in this case, we're going to check two things. Are we talking about personal data? What's the definition of personal data? And secondly, what's the definition of processing? Are you actually processing personal data? If yes, then GDPR applies. If no, then GDPR does not apply and you're a happy bird. If it does apply, so we're not going to touch upon all the matters relating to territorial applications. So that's for some, some other time. If you have particular questions about that, I'm happy to, to discuss. But this is not the, the focus of our, our discussions tonight. Um, if the GDPR does apply, we're going to check within which limits you can do the processing. So generally, GDPR is not blocking for anything, but there are certain things that you need to observe. So there are certain principles, and you always need a legal basis. We're going to go into that. Uh, and then particularly, how to take on big data in practice. Very important and potentially complicating principles are these principles of transparency. We don't really know what's going on when dealing with big data. Data quality is the profile that is being constructed about me. Is that really accurate? Is that really me? Does it reflect my personality the way I see it or the way that other people see it? What can I do about this? Brings me to data subject rights. We all have a number of rights under GDPR. How to deal with that under for in, in the case of big data. And then perhaps it, uh, impact uh, assessments and uh, data protection by design and by default particular uh, interest for big data uh, and in particular the developers among you. So thinking of big data, 
There's a huge number of applications, as you <coughs> know, we can think of all the data that's being collected through our phones, through our watches, can be combined with, for example, the payment uh, instructions with the, 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 the maps if we go in, so always geolocalized, uh, people establish certain routines, all these service providers know about this. Uh, and, and uh, can drive certain information about this in order to offer you more uh, useful services, for example. A lot of information is known, for example, by loyalty cards, thinking of uh, your supermarkets, all of them uh, uh, collect all these informations if you have such a, such a card. And then uh, credit card companies, well, obviously, perhaps banking was one of the well big users of big data, thinking of all the, the profiling that is being done for fraud detection, for example. Now, more recently, commercial banks have entered into these um, initiatives to do profiling because, well, they know their clients really well, of course. Uh, they know their habits, they know their shopping habits, they know if you go buy knives on uh, some, some website, for example, if, you, if you're into porn, your bank knows everything. So they have very sensitive information about their clients. And some banks, like ING, has uh, come out with this initiative to use this uh, information in order to offer uh, more personalized services. But there was a lot of resistance against this because people don't want their banks to be using this information to m know more about their clients because some way or another a bank is still uh, um, a, tr a trustworthy person. Another example of things that can go wrong was I have forgotten now, was it IBM that has uh, done this, uh, this mistake with the facial recognition? Um, they have used all the, the, the pictures on uh, Flickr, so the, the huge database with all the, 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 the pictures that are freely accessible that are published under a Creative Commons license or some kind of free license uh, in order to train their algorithms and in order to recognize certain faces, but of course, I was not thinking about GDPR, so from the IP side you're covered because it's, it's uh, an, an open license, so you can use these, uh, these, these pictures from the photographer's point of view, but of course that does not entail any authorization to use the faces of the people in order to train and identify certain, certain uh, all, all the people. So then in the middle, of course, we have the giants of data collection, um, the browsers, that know, of course, more than anyone uh, about us and what we do on the internet. Speaking of which, big, uh, two big groups um, that are very strong in uh, data collection and the, the, the combining of data are, of course, Google and uh, Facebook. Now, if you go and look into the terms of service of Google, of uh, YouTube, for example, or, uh, or, or Gmail, they will actually tell you, we're using everything. There's nothing you can do about this. If you're using our services, we're going to be using um, everything. We're going to use your IP, um, your IP address. Even when you log out of your Gmail, we're still going to use your unique identifiers in order to know more about you and in order to uh, discover the videos you like, we're, we're going to try to use this uh, together with your localization, etc. They're very transparent about this in, in, in a way. There's no opt-out, but at least they're upfront about this. Is it that transparent? Because then you, you get uh, terms, uh, like it's a uh, page is long that you have to read and then sign in. But for Google it's not that long. Yeah. When you use the Google search engine, it's not that long. You click like three times, perhaps. The problem is there's nothing you can do but accept. Yeah. That's that's. But that's a different problem. So there's we're going to come back to that. There's two aspects to 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 that. There's information and there's consent. Everybody has to inform. Even if you don't need in, consent to do the processing, you still need to inform. Google does that. I think quite well. They, their language is accessible, it's simple, you know what they're going to do, except that there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. And same thing for Facebook, of course, was the big, or well, the big question, what are they going to do? Facebook, uh, Instagram, and uh, WhatsApp belong to the same group. 
what are they going to do about this? So this is also this raises a lot of competition issues as well, of course, because Facebook becomes very big and becomes incontournable. We can't do anything uh, without Facebook anymore. They acquire these small startups that are very small in value, like there is very little on the balance sheets, but the value in user data is gigantic, of course. And so at first, uh, competition authorities did not really know what to do with this. Because there's a, it's a small company, it's a startup, it's fine, they can acquire this, but without taking into account the value of the user data and the, the, the potential in the combination, in, uh, in combining all these user data. So this is, um, this is a, a new challenge for well, regulatory uh, authorities, such as competition authorities, that are not used to, to dealing with data. They have to look at competition law from a different angle now as well. Now, there's many risks. You probably know about these, uh, these risks as well. First thing that we're all concerned about is the tracking. We're being tracked whatever we do, wherever we go, when we click on different websites. Companies know, companies know, or governments know. This gives us an, an, uncomfortable, an uncomfortable feeling. If it's only ads, you could say, okay, that's a trade-off, there's something to be said, fine, I'm going to get ads anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's, um, that's fine, fair enough, if that's going to be personalized. But it's different if, of course, it influences your possibility to acquire a certain service, if you're being dealt differently, uh, well, you're given different conditions because you've liked uh, certain things or you don't like cer certain things. And then there's a the whole question of, Government, uh, government tracking as well. Perhaps not in Europe, maybe, we don't really know, but especially, well, we, we already know that in the US there has been a big scandal with the PRISM, uh, the PRISM scandal that was brought out by Snowden, and then uh, we read every week we read these reports about China and the way they're making these social reports. So this is a thing, and this is something that worries people and there makes them a bit uh, reluctant to, to, to share and to engage in relationships online. Secondly, there's of course security. F recently, it was, uh, it was brought out in the press that uh, Facebook, for example, they stored all the passwords of the users, perhaps not all the users, but a big chunk of their users in plain text. No problem, so any, the, 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 the file got out, there was no protection whatsoever to the file, so the passwords of all their users were just exposed. There's a problem with trust, because people don't understand why am I seeing the things that I'm seeing. Okay, I've checked these, this, this pair of shoes on Zalando a week ago, but why do they keep following me? Why is this happening? And perhaps if you know a bit more about uh, digital, digital happenings, it's fine, and you know how that works with cookies and all that stuff, but if you don't, people think that their computers are hacked, and it gives them a very uncomfortable feeling. There's a problem, of course, with inaccuracy as well, because well, there's a lot of assumptions being made. I'm being profiled, and I might meet certain criteria giving, giving me a certain, a certain profile as someone who's a risk seeker, for example, meaning that my, uh, my insurance company will want to know about this, but actually I'm not. I'm a very, I'm a very good girl. I go to sleep every, uh, at, at 10 every night, so there might be an... an, an um, an inaccuracy in the deductions that people make on the basis of my data. They're not flawless. Huh? And then there's a whole issue, very difficult issue about discrimination. Again, it's in the profiling. But profiling, we're all being profiled. And if I um, use my computer at a certain point uh, to buy a, a flight ticket and I get a different price from you, for example, there is a certain type of price discrimination, that's true. But it becomes more troublesome, of course, if the discrimination is a prohibited pr discrimination, if it's one of the pr uh, discriminations on a prohibited grounds. So uh, that is uh, a problem. Other problems are nudging. I'm being pushed to doing something that I don't really want to do. And we know that companies are spending huge amounts of monies into the design of their services. For example, if I 
I love my website, I use this color rather than that color, people will respond in a different way. If I do the, the, well, the arrangement of my website differently, I put the yes button on the left hand side, right, uh, right, uh, on the right hand side it's a no button, people will act differently. And so we're being merged into certain behaviors which we do not necessarily know in, in, in advance and perhaps we're not really, uh, we don't really want either. So there's a whole, a whole science into, into nudging, into influencing uh, uh, people into, well, exposing behavior that they don't really want or they haven't really thought about. There might be unfair treatment, going back to, for example, my, uh, to, to my example of the, the flight tickets. I'm checking a flight, it's fair, it's good, I want to do it, but I have to go get my credit card. And the time I come back, the price has gone up. It's not a prohibited discrimination, it's not an illegal discrimination on one of the illegal grants, but I fear, I, I, am, I, I feel like I'm being treated in an unfair way, so it's not nice to be treated this way. And so, of course, one of the big uh, issues relating, relating to discrimination is that existing differences in uh, imbalances, for example, economic imbalance, are being perpetuated because these are the assumptions, it happens very frequently, and so these behaviors are going to be uh, perpetuated. For example, um, well, Google uh, as well has been in, uh, exposed as offering jobs for lower paid jobs to women and so women who are looking for a job will uh, be offered less frequently uh, management positions which is a problem of course now in reality we see that many women well, there's fewer women in, in management positions but through this profiling uh, algorithms this is an, an imbalance and inequality that is perpetuated so this is something we need to be uh, aware of, and this is a risk that uh, people identify as well. So many um, applications exist already in terms of big data. We have autonomous cars. First tests are being uh, run uh, out, uh, out in the open. There's insurance, uh, insurance applications, of course. Marketing, of course. Uh, we know we're very familiar with all these uh, advertising that is being well, uh, offered on a personalized basis. Uh, retail, thinking of the supermarkets, uh, sending you uh, certain well, discount vouchers for s on the basis of what you've bought in, in the past. Mobility, thinking of ways, uh, ways, for example, following you around and giving you suggestions into which roads to take in order to reach your destination uh, more quickly. And then, of course, uh, search, uh, search applications. Public sector is doing this uh, as well, perhaps less in the open, but for example, for the tax authorities, we know that they're doing this already. So the laws uh, have already been adapted for them to be able to do this, and so they can profile uh, the, the citizens who have to pay their taxes in order to find irregular behavior and in order to make more targeted uh, tax, uh, tax controls. Private sector, that's quite obvious. So when we're talking specifically about big data, I suggest to cut, uh, cut the process up in three, uh, in, in, well, three phases. First phase is collecting data. We're going to see the collecting of large quantities of data, more than there used to be. The data are, are, are gathered from diverse sources and they're a very different type of data. So um, Google, for example, they will get all the data they can uh, lay their, their hands on. They're not going to make a selection in the collecting stage, they're going to get all the data and they'll see afterwards if it's useful, yes or no. So this is a difference to, um, to, to the situation we knew before the internet, before the powerful devices, before the, um, the digitalization. Yes? This is just a working definition for, for what we're going to do today. Uh, it has no direct relevance for a GDPR application, yes or no. So we'll come back uh, to, to your specific case afterwards. First phase, 
collecting of data. I'm going to get as many data as I can, regardless of the source. Secondly, I'm going to analyze the data and try to see if I can find correlations, if I can make certain profiles, if I can make some certain uh, algorithms. So a um, person with that type of profile is likely to expose this kind of behavior. Well, this is uh, a certain logic that I will be able to apply in my third phase. Now, in many companies and many of my clients, for example, tell me, but I don't have a problem here because I do anonymize all the data, so there's no issue anymore. I can do whatever uh, I want to do. We'll come back to this. Anonymization, even the act of anonymizing a bunch of data is an act that might be, uh, might be covered under the GDPR. So this is an issue that might, um, might be relevant still. And then a third phase, so I've had collection of data, I've, had, I've made some models, I've made my algorithms, I know what I want to do with it. These, the result of this is indeed a quite theoretical, conceptual uh, model. Nothing really personal anymore. But then in the third phase, again, I'm going to apply the models, the result of my second phase, I'm going to apply this to individuals in order to see does this individual, this, this particular individual fit my profile? If it does, then I can uh, deduct certain consequences about this person. Yeah? So, if this, this is a schedule that we're going to, well, we're going to be working with, yeah? Question, next question, is to any type of schedule in accordance to, well, with these three phases, does the GDPR actually apply? And how am I going to conceive the application of the GDPR? We need to check, firstly, if we're talking about personal data. And personal data is defined by the GDPR as any information relating to an identified or identifiable person, data subject. We're uh, no longer individuals, we're called data subjects now. This is a very large notion. We're not only taking into account identify, identified persons, me, sorry, yeah, but any person who can be identified, a person who um, can be di identified directly or indirectly. For example, by reference to an identifier, I have an identification number, for example. Think of, well, uh, many employees in, in companies have a staff number, yeah, a personnel number. Can be location data, can be an online uh, identifier. Maybe my, my uh, email address is not um, sayedipur at hotmail.com, but it's, uh, it is goldfish22 at hotmail.com. It's not because you don't know my name that I'm not identified. I'm individualized, so my data, the data you collect about me, are personal data. Moreover, even if you don't have a specific identifier, if you have factors that are specific to a person, for example, their uh, physical features, genetics, mental or uh, economic, cultural, social identity of a person, that might be sufficient for you to be an identifiable person. And especially if you have several of these data, for example, thinking again of what Google is doing, I don't need to know, I don't need you to be logged into my Google services. I know your IP address, I know your MAC address, I know your browser type, I know the type of phone that you're using, and all these things together allow me to identify you even if you've never logged into your Gmail or your Google, uh, your Google account. So I know enough about you to uh, identify you, even if I don't. So this is a very large notion, and it's meant to be as well. You need to keep in mind that the GDPR, it's a piece of legislation that is meant to protect individuals. So we're going to, at the phase of the scope of application of the GDPR, we're going to keep this very large. We want, the legislator wants as many as possible to be covered under the GDPR. At, uh, so don't start excluding too quickly when you're wondering, I'm designing this application, but I'm not asking for email addresses, I'm not asking for this or that. Don't exclude the application of the GDPR too quickly. Keep in mind that starting from the moment that you can 
single out a person and you can modify or influence or nudge this person because you, you know it is one particular person, consider, be on the safe side and consider that the GDPR applies to your application. Now, GDPR applies uh, to all natural persons that are identifiable and you need to assess this idea of is a person identifiable, yes or no, on the basis of a number of factors that are listed in the GDPR as well. So all means that are reasonably likely to be used, either by the controller <coughs> or by any other user. And this is a very important point. It's not just you who should be able to identify the person, but if you're collection of data allows a third party to identify the person, this is sufficient for the GDPR to apply because the person by whom you're collecting the data is an identifiable person. What are the factors that will be uh, taken into account? What's the cost of identification, of course? If it's so expensive to actually go and identify the person that becomes prohibitive, then it's okay. Then nobody will actually do it. Then it's fine. You can do it. But this, of course, becomes rare and rare. The uh, technology becomes very widely available and it becomes very, very cheap to identify a person. So this might become less likely. Do you have some kind of interest in identifying a person? Do you have any uh, purpose? Is this your purpose or not? Can you get any advantages from uh, identifying the persons? And of course, all of these factors need to be uh, uh, assessed, taking into account the evolutions of uh, technology. For example, thinking back of the 90s, well, um, it was very difficult if you had one piece of information about a person um, without having their name, it was very difficult to actually I identify the person to find out who this person was or to treat them differently. But now, with the internet, with Google uh, in particular, it becomes you need two or three, four data points about uh, a person in order to identify and re-identify a person as well. So this is an, a notion that becomes very interesting as well um, when companies are using pseudonymized data. So it's not well, they're not entirely anonymous, but they've used all these um, uh, hashed, uh, hashed uh, identifiers for, uh, for, for a particular person. Not many points, data points are, are uh, needed in order to re-identify the person. So the easier it becomes using technology to re-identify to re a person, the more likely it is that, uh, that it, it is possible to identify a person and so you fall within the scope of uh, the GDPR. Keep in mind this notion of singling out. Certain from the moment that it's possible to single out a person even if you don't know their names, if you don't know their uh, addresses, but you can have an impact on the person's behavior, then you should consider that the GDPR applies. Now it's not only the fact of identifying that is considered, uh, considered um, personal data, but it's all the information you can get about this person. So all the data that you can tie to an individual. It can be data referring to the identity, characteristics, behavior of an individual, and um, all the information that is used to determine or influence the way in, that per, uh, in, in which that person is treated or evaluated. And here we see again this notion of singling out. Uh, I know who you are, I have enough means in order to nudge you, in order to, to push certain buttons in order for, for you to go and behave in a certain way, even if you did not anticipate in this person. So some examples from the case law of the European Court of Justice. So that's the court in Luxembourg. Cases that were brought before the Court of Justice. For example, employees working uh, the timesheets. So uh, people are working, they have to fill out what they've, been, what they've been doing all day. This is personal data. So you have the name of the person, the name of the employee, but then also all the stuff that they've filled out, the time that they've been working, what they've been doing. So everything they've, they've filled in, that's considered personal data. A person's image by CCTV. And then uh, more recently there was a case um, if I'm not mistaken, about a Romanian citizen who was arrested 
and he was uh, kept at um, a police office, uh, police, uh, police uh, station. He was filming the arrests and he was filming the, the, well, the face of the police officers. And the court s confirmed so, but there was some, well, the person did not really trust that he was going to be treated in a fair way, so he preferred to film the entire, uh, the entire arrest and, and uh, his detention. And so afterwards, the police actually lodged a complaint against this person whom they had detained because of infringement of uh, data protection rules. So the courts confirmed that indeed, if you're filming a person, even if that's a police officer or any, t uh, any uh, other person, you film this person using your phone, this is uh, personal data. So the image of the person is uh, personal data. So tax data, uh, information in a, uh, a press release, for example, even if the, the, the person is not named you, the, the, the name of the person is not, uh, is not mentioned, but everybody knows about whom this, uh, this article was going, um, well, this is personal data. Fingerprints uh, can, be, uh, can be considered personal data, an IP address in certain circumstances can as well, and exam script. So for example, that was, um, uh, accountants, an accountant in Ireland who had passed the accountancy exam a couple of times, once, twice, three times, didn't succeed um, and in the end he wanted to see where he was wrong, where he wanted to consult in the copy of, uh, of his exam and they refused, but then he uh, relied on the GDPR world or the predecessor of the, the GDPR, so personal pr protection of personal data, in order to gain access to his exam, and this was admitted. So the court indeed said, your exam script, your handwritten copy of your exam is personal data. Now, importantly, what you need to remember here is that it's a very broad notion, and the fact that a person acts in a professional context does not suffice to disqualify the protection of personal data. Again, we're in a protective context, we're uh, in well, regulation that's meant to protect uh, a person. So even when we're in a professional context, the GDPR can apply. And so this is very frequently done, of course, in the context of labor relationships. Huh? A uh, person, uh, person has a, a bad evaluation, they want to know why, they want to see their staff, uh, their staff file, um, they will try to rely or they can rely on the GDPR in order to gain access to these evaluations. So once we've established whether or not the data that you're processing are personal data, the second question is, is there any processing? How does the GDPR define the act of processing? Well, again, very broadly, it's a protective uh, set of, of, uh, of rules. So broad definition of the act of processing. It's any operation or set of operations uh, which is performed on personal data or a set of personal data, whether or not by automated means. And then the GDPR gives a list of examples of acts that are considered uh, processing. Collecting, recording, organizing, structuring, storing, adapting, altering, retrieving, consulting, using, disclosing, disclosing by transmission, dissemination, otherwise making available, aligning, combining, restricting, erasing, destructing, all of these acts are examples of processing of personal data or other data. So it's extremely, it's extremely broad. So any type of digital use that you can think of will fit in one of these categories. Uh, can I give an extra example? Of course. There's even one where uh, if you have a robot taking tapes of backups, this is processing personal data. You can say that the robot is not reading the data on the tapes. But the person who has programmed the robot can potentially make a copy of it. Even a printer, the printers are, uh, there's a framework, are dated when once you scan something and send your email, potentially you have to have a contract with your uh, printer provider because potentially they might scan and send all the documents in your company to their home office headquarters. So it's not like reading, if I give you my CV, you read it, you give it back after two minutes, you have done some processing. So it's very, very wide. Mm -hmm. yep. 
And so some examples from the, the, the case law uh, from the European Court of Justice. First uh, case that was ever decided was a Lindqvist uh, case um, where there was an issue about a person loading certain information on an internet. But this dates back this, I think the decision was taken in like 2000 or 2001 or something. So it dates back to the 90s, very primitive internet at that time. But already at that uh, point in time, the court considered that if you upload certain information about the availability of a person for church group or something of the sort, this is an act of processing. And so you should uh, apply the data protection rules. Same thing, collecting information and transferring on a CD-ROM, text messaging, uh, communicate, uh, communicating uh, information in response to a request for access to documents, all these things are considered acts of processing. And then, of course, uh, a case decided on Google search, crawling, uh, indexing, transmitting uh, of search results by a search engine, all of these acts, different phases of uh, search operations are considered distinct acts of processing. So very importantly, because Google at that, uh, in, in this conflict, stated that, well, actually it's not us who are processing this information, it's the websites that we crawl. So we don't have any responsibility in relation to the, 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 the information that can be found about an individual. You have to go and complain with the person who initially uh, published the information. But the court there said rightly, well, there's one uh, act of processing is the, the initial publication of the information on the, the, the on the website, but there's a distinct act of processing when Google goes and retrieves all this information, indexes the information, and serves them as uh, search results. So that's an important point. And then again, the video recording. So the the guy in the Romanian. Uh, police uh, police station, he was actually uh, processing the images and therefore personal data. So when we're going back to our three phases of data processing, big data processing, question can be asked when I'm collecting data, all kinds of data, personal data, non-personal data, am I processing yes or no? Obviously yes, you're processing uh, personal personal data. With the analysis, it's more nuanced because as, for, as long as the individuals remain identifiable, yes, you're processing personal data. But at some point, if you actually manage to anonymize the data and you have this pure conceptual framework, you, only, you have a pure conceptual model, at that point, all personal data are gone. There is no personal data left anymore. So at that point, you stop processing personal data. However, if you start applying your model to individuals in order to target uh, individuals, in order to influence their behavior, make them uh, buy certain products, then of course, you're again processing personal data because there's this active application of a conceptual model to a set of real person data. single person that uh, where we know when we, uh, the specific person that we want to target or we want to target like a segment is always uh, don't take any risks at this point in time because you won't you, what are you talking about uh, I, I don't like targeting uh, <coughs> But that doesn't matter. So you have a big database of users, is what you're saying, and you're applying certain criteria, you're applying a certain profile to your database of known users. Yeah? But you're selecting a number of users among your known users. I'm not aware. I can get a little specific. Okay, let's say that we understand some feature about, uh, about our potential uh, user, okay? Uh, from the analysis moment, from the phase. And then we try uh, we targeting based on the, on the feature that we discovered that are more relevant to us. I mean, 
let's say that we discover that feature on our, uh, our potential client. And we target... A feature or a fissure? A feature. A feature. Like, uh, I don't know, an uh, um, age range that for us is better, okay? And then we target based on that specific feature. It's, all, uh, it's, it's still anonymous. Because Your filter is anonymous, but the outcome won't be anonymous because you want to send an email or whatever to the to the selection, the subset of, of your, your database, no? Yes. So in, in, in the second phase, when you're making your filter, which might be a bit more sophisticated than, than age range, because for just age range, you don't need the, collect the collection of yeah, data. It's just like But in or if you want to apply a certain criteria to a database of known persons, yes, you're, you're processing personal data. Yeah, yeah. The fact that you know the persons and that at some point they, you've, they've, you've collected the data and you've stored them in a database is one act of processing, but then you're going to be using the database. And so every time you're going to be using this database in order to do mailings, for example, in order to address uh, an, an email, uh, in order to, to look for, uh, for, for correlations, for example, you will be doing acts of, of, of processing. But that's a different thing. We're going to come back to the to the to the legal basis. We're going to come back to that later. Now we're just asking the question: Are we processing personal data? Yes or no? Afterwards, we'll see: Are you allowed to process? Yes or no? Are you within the conditions to process? Yes or no? Is your act legal? Now we're just asking, does GDPR apply, yes or no? So your collection will be an act of, uh, of, of processing of personal data. Your selections, your analysis, your application of your filters, uh, the sending of the emails, all of that will be distinct acts of processing. For example, that could be for uh, different purposes as well. So you might, you might have a client database because you need to invoice. You're a consultant, you, you're, uh, you're delivering certain, uh, certain services, you need the data in order to, uh, to invoice, in order to deliver your services. That's one purpose, yeah? But no, it's already two purposes. It's an entirely different thing if afterwards you go and profile these people in order to sell their data to a marketing company, for example. That's an entirely different uh, act of processing for a different type of pro pro uh, purpose. So for anonymization, very often you have a data set and people say, okay, but I want to do statistics, I want to learn more about uh, clients, I want, to, I want to have a more precise profile, uh, I'm going to anonymize my data so I can't see the identity of the, the, the people anymore. Now this in itself is an act of processing, so you need to take this into account when you're drafting your information policies, when you're looking for consent for legitimate interest for uh, performance of a contract, whatever your legal basis may be. This is one of the things that you need to keep in, uh, in, in mind as well. Now it's only this act of uh, anonymization, of, of taking away the identification of the person, that is an act of processing. Once this is done and the person is actually anonymous, then you can do whatever you want from a GDPR point of view, of course. You can do whatever you want. So there's no more personal data because you can't re-identify the person. By contrast, very often when people think that they're anonymizing data, they're actually just pseudonymizing and they're substituting the name of a person by some kind of hashed, uh, hashed identifier. Now, this is not anonymization because it's still possible for them to indeed to, to identify, to re-identify the person. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, if you can do it, fine, do it. It's still better than to have uh, all these, all these uh, readable uh, personal data stored somewhere. But if 
it's not anonymization. So when you're, you're dealing with pseudonymous data, you're still dealing with personal data and you still have to apply all the rules of uh, the, the GDPR. So keep, keep this in mind because this is, it's an error, that it's a very common error. Okay, once we've established GDPR applies because we're processing personal data. We have to take into account certain principles for processing and we have to look for legal grounds. There are specific rules for sensitive data and we'll, we'll go into the specific rules for profiling because this is important in the context of big data as well. When processing personal data, you always have to keep in mind these principles. There very broad principles with a very broad application. First principle, personal data can only be processed to the extent that the processing is lawful, it's fair, and it happens in a transparent way. And don't underestimate this requirement because uh, Facebook, for example, has been convicted in, uh, by the, the Brussels court because of lack of transparency. Facebook has a huge number of uh, information policies um, where they clearly state in, uh, uh, at length how, which uh, data they collect, how they collect it, why they're processing, how they're processing it, etc. So they give a lot of information. But the judge in this case said, well, it's not clear for a person because they have to consult two or three or four of these policies, they have to combine all these policies and in the end they're lost. Even if the formal requirements of the right of information are met, all the mentions that had to be there were there, but in the end if you take everything together there's a problem with transparency because in the end I don't know anymore what you're doing. So there's still a, a problem. So even if you meet the precise obligations, you still have to keep in mind, does your user, your targeted user, your targeted public, do they understand what you're doing, how you're doing it, and for what purposes you're doing it? And if this, well, you can't just lose yourself in these legal texts that don't mean anything after a certain point anymore, you need to make sure that the, the, the processing happens in a transparent way. Second key principle of data processing is purpose limitation. Now this is a very important point because it, thinking as well for the, the developers among you and the business people among you have to work together with the developers, you need to know in advance before your uh, processing begins, you need to know in advance for which purposes you're going to be processing the, the, the personal data. So you need to know in advance, I'm going to be using, I'm going to be collecting these data and I'm going to be using them, for example, for delivering my service uh, because I'm Amazon and I need to deliver a book. I need to know the address. I need to know the book so I can prepare the, the, the order. I need to be able to give the, the, the address to the driver, etc. This is one purpose. I need to know um, I'm going to have to bill the person. I have to be able to manage the, the returns. But I may also want to do some, um, some, some advertising. I may want to do some, uh, some promotions. I want to do marketing as well. So all of these things you need to know in advance and you need to set in advance. Once this is done, the um, data cannot be processed in a way that is incompatible with the purposes for which the data were collected in the first place. And this is a very important point because this will have a big impact of course on, uh, on big data where as a matter of principle, you get a lot of data and you'll see afterwards what you do with, uh, with the information. There's one exception for statistical purposes and this might help up to some extent, but that only goes so far. It's just for making statistics, so it might help you with building your model and building your, your concept, but it m may not help you anymore when you want to go and apply these models to a set of data. And so if the subsequent purposes are not compatible with the initial purposes, then you have to start the whole, uh, the whole you, you can't use them and you have to start the whole uh, process again. Thirdly, principle of data minimization. Depending on the purposes that you've set 
at the beginning of, of, of your processing. You can only use the data that you actually need in order to achieve your purpose. So you can't be collecting all these data just randomly and, uh, and, 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 and stack them. I'll see afterwards what I can do with this. You have to decide, <coughs> depending on the purposes that you've set in advance, which data do I actually need in order to achieve uh, my purpose. If you gather data in order to well, deliver uh, the book, for example, there is no need, you don't need to know a person, how many children a person have, has. You don't need to know whether they're married, yes or no. Don't ask for this information if your purpose is just to deliver a parcel. If you want to process uh, a payment, same thing. You don't need to know the sexual orientation of a person, for example. So don't ask for this information. You don't need it in order to complete these, these, uh, this, this task. The data needs to be accurate and you need to make an effort to keep the, the quality of the data high. You have to have the correct data. If your data is outdated, then you need to make an effort to bring them up to date. Um, or even delete it as we, uh, as we will see afterwards. Uh, what I mean is, for example, uh, this 10-year challenge that Facebook had before for face recognition, how you used to be 10 years ago and how do you look now? Mm -hmm. It's like a challenge that they kind of push people to post pictures, but actually what they wanted to do is maybe to get data for how people change over time. Yep. So no one told you, okay, but, uh, give me your picture so that later on I can use this for a software and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So basically it's like a good thing in GDPR like a concept, but actually, actually no one is using it. Yet. And uh, what, we, we, what we study in this course is basically, in one word, is collect as much data as you want, as raw as you want, and then we're going to figure out how to use it. Yeah. But here we'll see, because this, it's very early to see if uh, GDPR is effective, yes or no. It's been one year? Yeah. We'll see. And we see now, every month, we see uh, very important uh, fines being imposed upon Facebook, upon Google on the big, uh, the big data users. We'll see if this is sufficient for them to modify their behavior. Um, so far, perhaps not. But on the other hand, we can see um, legislation does have an impact. For example, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Google Spain case. So um, what am I saying? It's not, it's not Google Spain, oh sorry. Uh, it's uh, Schrems, uh, the Schrems uh, uh, against Facebook. So this was this uh, individual, uh, an um, Austrian, Austrian citizen, who was opposed against all the data transfers by Facebook um, between the, Bel uh, the, the, the European, the, well, the European uh, company and the US company. Because, well, after the Snowden scandal broke out, we know that the American Secret Service has access to, to the data, uh, Hotmail, Gmail, uh, all well, the emails that are stored, Facebook, all the, the messages or the information that's stored in the US. And so there was uh, an international transfer to the US, data are accessible from the US, and this was based on some kind of adequacy decision. So the commission back in the years 2000, 2001, 2000, oh no, 2000, I think, they had made an evaluation saying like, okay, um, we'll set in, in, in place some kind of mechanism, um, so there's some kind of control over the use of the data. And if the companies going through the self-assessment, they say they comply, then it's fine. For us, it's, 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 it's fine. And so the commission at that point in time thought, okay, this is sufficient guarantees. Uh, we need some guarantees before transferring to, to the US, but the guarantees are sufficient, so it's fine. But then came the whole, the whole scandal with uh, the PRISM, and we know now uh, what those people well, we know we have some kind of idea, a light idea of what the, the Secret Services did with, uh, with uh, all this uh, stored information. And so Schrems, this citizen, goes and addresses this and says, well, actually, this proves that actually uh, since 2000, in, I don't know, 
15 years, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot has changed. And so the guarantees that were sufficient back in the day are not sufficient anymore. Yeah? And so this was brought before the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice agreed with, uh, with uh, Schrems, said you can't do this anymore. And so either you find a new mechanism which is debated as well as being challenged before the Court of Justice again. Uh, but either you change the system and you make sure that the guarantees for citizens, European citizens, are better, or you stop transfers at all. So there is a way, it's true, it's, it's difficult to make changes, but at some points it's, it's possible to make changes as well. And so it's only Europe where the, the GDPR applies. But we'll see. And it's still a big market, and it's possible that indeed even those big data, big, big data users will be well more respectful of of, uh, of European uh, law at some point in time. But I think it's a bit early to to assess this. And same thing for for Google. Huh? It's, uh, Google was uh, in, in in this Google Spain case was convicted. They've made the balance between the interests of Google in commercializing a search uh, service and the individuals, uh, well, there was this one individual by whom information that was outdated was still, was still available, but the court said there's a right to, to, to be forgotten. And if certain conditions uh, apply, you can ask all the data to be, to be erased. It's an important point because now it's in GDPR as well and Google had to actually provide uh, a mechanism in order to allow individuals to uh, manifest themselves to come forward and say this information that is findable on through Google is not accurate. Please remove this from your indexes. And Google has complied, so in a sense, I'm not sure if it works well because I haven't tried it. But at least they've adapted their behavior as well. So I wouldn't be so negative at this point in time. We'll see, like in five years, when we have a better idea about um, about the, the the efficiency of GDPR. I think there's a big problem there. I think you've touched the point of, upon a, a very valid point. It's it's difficult. We've we've all had elections yeah. now uh, a couple of weeks ago. Technology and the use of technologies was not an issue. Nobody has talked about what are we going to do with artificial intelligence? What are we going to do about uh, about digitization? About about uh, robotization? Not an issue. So I do think there's there's a problem there with the policymakers. Not at the European level. I think they're fairly fairly well aware of the of of, of data and, and well the challenges that data and use of data uh, pose. But I think at the national levels there might be a, there might be an issue. Yeah. But same thing goes for the for the population. Huh? People don't really care. They won't to use Google. They want to use Facebook, so... You also don't have an option. If you don't use them, you're socially excluded. So it's another issue. If I don't have a LinkedIn and I want to change my job, how are they going to find me? They want to be what's your problem. Or like, you don't have a Facebook, huh? It's, I don't want to hire socially weird person. Mm. I don't have someone that I know you quite hire. Mm. So in order not to be excluded, I have to say yes. Or True. I don't but that, that's why it's very important. That's why these uh, principles are very important because these apply even if you have said yes. If you have said yes, so we'll, we'll come to the consent part in, in in a while. But these principles apply even when you've said yes. So you've consented to something, you, as you said, correctly pointed out. I've consented to using Facebook for keeping in touch with my grandma, for my cousins who are abroad. That's my purpose for using Facebook. And then afterwards, additional features come. And, well, I did not consent to this. It's just being imposed. Well, there's a, very, it's, it, there's a big issue of purpose limitation. There's a, a big issue of, uh, of, of data minimization because obviously they are gathering more data than they actually use, they actually need for the purposes that were initially stated. Especially, and this is something that we don't know anything about, especially when, when um, they start uh, combining all the data, they start interpreting your likes, your comments, your your posts. That's a that's a big question. That's a very big question. But regardless of whether or not you've consented, these principles apply. And on 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 this basis, there's something to be said in 
to well, certain certain companies do not respect the GDPR, even if you've consented. Yeah. So storage limitation goes back again to these purposes. So the purposes are already defined in advance. You can't keep the data longer than what is needed in order to uh, to achieve uh, the, the 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 purpose. Then there is a general uh, principle of integrity and confidentiality. You need to store data safely. You have to have. Uh, you have to have taken uh, the appropriate measures in order to make sure that the data are not being stolen, that there are, not, there are no leaks, um, there's no changes, there's no access by persons who are not entitled to, to have access, etc. And then a new principle which is very important under GDPR is accountability. The controller one who's responsible for the data processing is responsible for compliance with the principles and should be able to demonstrate the, the compliance. Meaning that, for example, when you're in your companies, you're setting up all your processes, your, your uh, technical processes, you need to document your thought process on, for example, have I taken into account, why am I I'm making a form to, f to be to be filled in. Why am I asking these questions? Do I need all the the, the, the fields that I'm asking uh, to to supply? For example, information about my family, about my private life. Do you actually need this yes or no? So you need to be able to demonstrate that you've asked yourself these questions and you've answered in a responsible way. So going back to big data, there's issues of course with transparency what people feel from well quite uh, from from their intuition big data it's like it functions like a black box I don't know why things are happening it's it's opaque I it, the mechanisms are not clear to me this is a ch challenging because there is this principle of transparency you need to be able to explain what happens with the data and how this is done Purpose limitation, well, obviously, collecting all these kinds of data, we'll see afterwards what we can do with this. Just get as much as you can, and then afterwards we'll see what we can do by, uh, with this. This is one of the inherent uh, features of, of, of big data and uh, artificial in uh, intelligence is the unpredictability of the outcome. Huh? You're just uh, finding possibilities when uh, developing the, the solutions. And of course, there's repurposing of data. You use the data for a certain purpose, but then you're using them for other purposes which is really in, in uh, big tension with this uh, principle of, of pers uh, purpose limitation. Same thing goes for data minimization and with the storage, uh, the storage limitation as well. People are just, companies are just collecting all the data they can get their hands on, uh, see what we can do with this afterwards, and even generating <coughs> new data. So using data, combining them with other data, inferring certain data, um, driving certain uh, other information, etc. All these uh, acts will generate new data, and there the question again is, well, does this really uh, comply with this principle of data minimization? Huh? Um, you know the contrast between the provided data, so the things that I tell Facebook, I am, I have my name, I have perhaps the, the city where I live, um, they have, that's, that's what I have provided, maybe my posts, maybe my comments, that's the data that I actively provide, but Facebook knows much more about me, they're observing how I behave on Facebook, they observe where I click, um, they derive certain, certain information about uh, the data that I have, um, that I have uh, provided, and they can infer certain information about me as well on the basis of uh, all the other things. So I'm getting profiled in ways that I don't even know anything uh, about, and this might indeed be uh, in, in, in well, tension with the principles of purpose limitation and data minimization. Do you guys want a break? Shall we take a short break? No? No? Who says yes? Okay. Short break.
Okay, so once we've gone through all the principles for processing, which apply regardless of the legal basis that you're, uh, that you're applying, you have to check whether all the operations, all the sets of operations, the instances of processing, are covered by a legal ground. We're not going to go through uh, all of them, but just know that these are the legal grounds. So the first is consent. I tell you in advance, this is the data that I'm going to collect. This is the, uh, the purposes I'm going to use your data for. These are the acts of processing. Are you, do you agree, yes or no? Secondly, it's performance of a contract. Particularly about the consent is, I consent now, but tomorrow I'll change my mind. I can withdraw my consent. Very inconvenient for companies. So at some point, we need to check different legal grounds. For example, performance of a contract. When you're um, in a relationship with an employer, for example, they will be processing, your employer will be processing a bunch of data, even if you have not consented. Yeah? So they will have to know your bank account, for example. If you don't consent, employer can't meet their, uh, their obligation, their contractual obligation to pay you by the end of the month. So even if you consent, you don't consent, your employer needs this information. This uh, legal grant allows the employer as well, by the end of the contract, to keep your data, even if you withdraw the consent because you have a conflict, you, you have a conflict, you don't want to be nice to your employer anymore, you, you, you want to withdraw your consent so they have to erase all the information, that will be very inconvenient. So there's an alternative uh, ground. Third ground is legal obligation. Think again of employer, collects all your data, has all your data, but needs to transfer certain data to tax authorities, to social security authorities. You don't want them to transfer the information to the tax authorities because you'll have to pay taxes. So consent, you will not give consent. But your employer is under the legal obligation. So even if you have not consented, they will still be able to transfer the information because they're under a legal obligation to do so. This processing in the case of uh, vital interest of uh, the data subject or third parties, for example, um, you have a heart attack, you fall in the street, people are entitled to check your phone, check your name, give your name to uh, the ambulance because otherwise you'll die. You can't die because of GDPR, that would be crazy. Um, there's public interest or uh, the official authorities of a uh, controller, that's for everything that's uh, like uh, notaries, for example, probably not very relevant for you. And then there's a very useful uh, grant, which is the legitimate interest or, of the controller or other parties. So think Google. Again, Google goes and crawls all the websites that are accessible to it. They process all the data, they store all the data, they serve the data as search results uh, when people are looking for, well, on the basis of certain keywords. Um, then there may be a lot of personal data in this process, but they're not doing this on the basis of consent. They can't go and contact all the persons who are mentioned on the websites that they're crawling. Uh, it's not feasible for them. They don't have a contract with all these people. So none of these, um, none of these legal basis apply. But we all agree that Google offers a useful service. So we have an interest in having access to a search service. Google has an interest in processing these data in order to provide a commercial service. Offering a commercial service as such is a legitimate, uh, a legitimate uh, intention covered by one of the fundamental rights as well, which is the right to, to enterprise. So it's legitimate for Google to be crawling all these data, to be processing all the data in order to, uh, to, to provide a service. However, so this gives a lot of flexibility. Eh? Whenever you don't really have any, none of the other grounds apply, you can always check if you have a legitimate interest in processing the data. However, you always have to check, and this is an exercise you have to make in advance for yourself, you always have to check if the interests or the fundamental, fundamental rights and freedoms of this data subject are not superior to your own interest. And this was the case in Google Spain. So the court says, yes, 
Google has an interest in processing all the information in, uh, in, in offering the search service. But if you keep offering search results, knowing that the information is wrong, it's outdated, it's about a person, the financial information about a person 20 years ago, which is no longer applicable, then this person's interests are superior to your commercial interests because, well, the person has been, uh, has been demonstrated or is, is displayed as having financial information. The person actually is fine by now, cleared all the debts, no longer a problem. But when the bank Googles this person, they still get this information as if this person is indebted. This is a problem. So in that case, no, Google, your uh, interests are um, inferior to the right to, uh, to f for this person to have correct information, to have uh, their lives uh, protected, their, their private lives protected. So this is a very flexible, and especially for startups, using a lot of you know, using a lot of data, not having uh, any of the other um, legal basis met. This is a very useful. It's a very useful basis, but you need to make. You need to ask the question in advance, which types of data am I using? For what purposes am I using them? Is it legitimate? And what is the impact of the processing on the person? Because if you're, okay, you have a small, um, uh, you have a small commercial interest, but your processing might lead to the data subject being killed by, I don't know, some kind of uh, hitman, then obviously your, process, your, your interests will be inferior to the interests of, uh, of a person, even though you're, you're, uh, you have a commercial interest. So this offers flexibility, but please make this, ask yourself the question, what is the impact of the processing of personal data on the person? Will they be, still be as free to exercise their rights, to have their fundamental rights, for example, uh, well, a lot of, um, freedom of organization, freedom of expression, freedom to receive information, freedom to impart information, etc. What is the impact of my processing of their personal data on this person and is there a balance? Starting from the moment that there's an, an, an imbalance, you need to stop doing this or you need to take additional measures in order to make sure that the balance is redressed. Yeah, but that's what this is designed for. Huh? So you're processing the data of all the children because you need to verify which kid is ill. Yeah? Yeah. But there's a legitimate interest, both for the controller, so the daycare, daycare center, but also the others, the other children and their parents. But there is also disclosure of the, for example, if my kid is not vaccinated, then I don't want this to be known by other people because this can be grounds of discrimination. Yeah, but we'll come back to sensitive data in, in a second. So that's, that's an additional layer that comes on top of this. So from a legal basis point of view, I think you have legitimate interest. Might even... Uh, it might be, yeah, exactly. It might even be the, the vital uh, interests of, of uh, the data subjects or third parties. So I don't think that's a, it's, it's not a sound legal reasoning uh, of that daycare center. That's insane. So yeah. Um, when you sign up, like on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, you, s you sign up like on the term terms. Uh, mm -hmm. the terms and conditions. Yeah. Is that a contract? I don't know the definition of a contract. What? what it might be both. Contract? It might be both because you could you could say. Um, I give consent for a number of data that are being processed, but the second a second basis might might apply because I want to use Facebook for 
interacting with my friends, with my, with my family. But in order to do so, Facebook needs to process certain personal data. So for the performance of the contract, as long as it's about my data, that's fine. This no longer applies when I start uh, sharing photos of third parties who are not on Facebook, for example, because this, it's, it's fairly narrow. It's only the performance of the contract to which uh, the data subject is a party. So all the others, well. And so when Facebook makes money because they do advertisement based on your profile, uh, you have the rights of you know, to make it and so on, but that's also part of the legitimate interest of the controllers to yeah. make money. Probably, yeah. So yeah. Do you think that Facebook is using, say, or we do advertisement based on your profile, based on what you like and so on, because it's a legitimate interest, or because of a contract, because the end of contract you have signed, that we say we use but there might be different. Uh, there might be different. Uh, layers yeah, layers. different layers, huh? because the performance of a contract will only cover the processing that's necessary for the performance of the contract. If it's useful or if it's fancy or maybe at some point it might serve, that's not sufficient. It's necessary for the performance of the contract. All the other stuff should be covered either by consent or by the legitimate interests of the, of the controller. But then again, you need the balance. And we know that commercial interests, as a matter of principle, will be inferior to, 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 to uh, protection of private life, for example. That's what we know from, uh, from the Google case. Now, if, we're going, uh, if you're going to base your processing on consent, you need to make sure that the consent is freely given it's specific, it's informed, it's unambiguous. So you always need to ask an affirmative action. You need the data subject to express consent. You can't have pre-tick boxes. That's an opt-out. We need an opt-in. Yeah. So you need the person to do something, to declare something. I'm fine with this. I'm signing here. Uh, you need to cover all the purposes, so the initial purposes and the further processing as well. And you need to do this before you start processing. Now, very importantly, the consent needs to be informed uh, and it needs to be understandable to the public. So it's no use writing a dense legal text that only lawyers can understand or even lawyers will, will, will uh, disagree about, you need to adapt the text to the public that you're, uh, you're targeting. You need to use clear and plain language. That's what uh, it's, it's, uh, that is required. If you don't, if you just draft something that's really difficult to understand for a non-specialist, your consent will not be legally binding. So you need to be careful about this. Questionnaire, of course, can you actually get a valid consent for uh, big data processes? Huh? Because it's so difficult, and uh, I don't think it's, it's the most uh, likely uh, legal basis. Importantly, when you're basing the processing on consent, you need to know that uh, the data subject has the right to withdraw consent at any time, and it should be easy. You can't bury this in difficult processes, in procedures to be followed, and five emails to be, uh, to be sent. If actually the, the initial processing was super easy, just tick the box and uh, click agree. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's an important, uh, important part. And the person should be able to withdraw consent without detriment, because otherwise, of course, the consent is not freely given. What's difficult in relation to big data here? Well, for consent, not so sure how you can go and, and ask for an informed and specific consent if in advance you don't know what's going to be the outcome of your big data processing. People have very, very limited understanding of how technology works. People are technophobic. So they don't understand and they don't want to know what you're doing. They just want the results. They want good results from Google. They want accurate results from Google. They don't care how this is done. So this is, of course, uh, very well, difficult to obtain a valid consent in, in uh, such a context. Huh? So one option could be if you're developing some kind of big data uh, solution or some kind of uh, um, solution on, on, on the basis of uh, uh, data analysis is to always have, well, 
when you go along to ask for granular consent. Okay, we're at this phase now. Are you still okay with us doing this? Uh, Facebook offering an additional an additional feature. Are you still okay with this? Yes, no. Becomes architecture of, of the solution becomes very complex, of course. Huh? But from a GDPR perspective, this is, of course, uh, the better option. Performance of a contract could be useful, uh, but GDPR is a bit limiting in the sense that you can only use this uh, legal grant to the extent that the data processing is necessary for performing the contract. And in many cases, this will not be the case. It might facilitate the performance of the contract, but it's not necessary to perform the contract. Legal obligation might be the case, for example, for profiling, uh, for um, money laundering, there might be applications where there's a legal obligation to do some, some profiling, perhaps, uh, that should be tested and might come, uh, come uh, more easily. I've read that in, in France, there's actual legislation providing a legal framework for public administrations to be using uh, uh, profiling techniques with all these um, guarantees that come in addition. You need to be able to explain what, what's the logic of, of, uh, of the algorithms, you need to be able to explain what were the factors that have uh, led to a particular decision. And this apparently, this legislation has been approved by the, the Constitutional Court in France. So um, quite innovative, I, I would say. And then uh, the legitimate interest might be the, the most um, useful grant for big data applications, but again, it's really necessary for, uh, to, to be processing the, uh, the, the data for particular purposes. And of course, there's always a possibility that the, the interests or the, the, the fundamental rights of the data subject are superior to the interests of the controller. So that's a bit of a risk as happened in, uh, in Google Spain. No? Then coming to sensitive data. Sensitive data is the, the short name for what's called officially in the GDPR special categories of data, which are data revealing racial, ethnic origin, political opinions, religious uh, or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership. Then there's genetic data, biometric data, so a whole bunch of, uh, of data relating to uh, the very private life of uh, the data subject. All these data, in addition to having the legal, uh, the, the legal ground, you need to make sure that you're actually entitled to process this information. And so this is where the measles, uh, the measles um, example needs to, to, to cross another, uh, another hurdle. Because as a matter of principle, it's prohibited to process sensitive data. You cannot write down that your employee is, uh, is gay, for example. You can't write down their uh, diseases. We know that it happens, but that means that we have to check if one of the grants for exceptions are met. For example, explicit consent. I'm going to be profiling, um, uh, I'm going to be processing uh, personal data, for example, uh, sexual orientation, but I am the publisher of a gay magazine Yes, I'd like, to, I'd like to know, I probably, if you're a subscriber of my magazine, then probably you're going to be gay. So I'm going to ask you for explicit consent. Is it okay that I know this about you? Um, in case of employment, social security, it's quite obvious. I call in sick tomorrow, I'm ill, I go to the doctor, I get a certificate. I have to send this to my employer don't want to give consent, but they need to process my, my uh, sensitive data, even if uh, well, it's going to show that I'm ill. Yeah? So it's sensitive data, but employee needs to know because, uh, because of um, employment regulation. Again, vital interests. This is where your measles uh, story comes in. Well, they need to be processing. They can have an exception if indeed there is processing uh, of sensitive data relating to the health uh, condition of these children, but it's in order to preserve the, the health of the other, uh, the other uh, children, etc. So you have a whole number of um, things that you can, uh, that one goes as well, the public health one goes as well. So your daycare, yeah, no. Um, whenever you're processing sensitive data, in addition to the legal 
basis, you need to check whether one of these uh, exemptions is applicable, yes or no. You need to know as well that these will be interpreted in a very strict way, and so there are not, so not going to be a lot of lenience. Then, coming to profiling. As a matter um, of principle, there is no prohibition as a matter of principle um, in the GDPR that prohibits profiling in general. What the GDPR regulates is the fact of being subject to a decision that is based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning the data subject or has uh, similarly significant effects on the on the, the data subject. So the fact of profiling in itself is not prohibited, but the fact of basing a decision with a considerable impact on a data subject only on this fact of profiling, on the acts of profiling, this <coughs> requires additional guarantees. What does profiling mean? According to the GDPR in one of the recitals, it is stated that profiling means any form of automated processing of personal data, consisting of using those data to evaluate certain personal aspects relating to the person, in particular to analyze or to predict aspects concerning that person, uh, person's performance at work, economic situation, health, personal preferences, interest, reliability, behavior, location, or movements. So that covers a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of uh, behavior predicting applications. Yeah? As such, the data subject has the right not to be subject to an automated decision. So nothing is said about profiling as such, but you can't only use profiling in order to induce a decision regarding a person uh, that has a significant impact. So for example, um, following a person, analyzing a person's behavior, and then automatically by an algorithm denying uh, a loan, for example, denying an insurance uh, for cars or houses or whatever, this is something that is, is, is not possible under the GDPR. Doesn't mean that the profiling can't be an element in a human decision, for example. So if you still have a human case handler using information from different sources, uh, among which automated profiling, that's not covered by this. Still need to still need to, to cover the, the legal basis and the principles, etc. But this is this um, this principle will not apply as such. Yeah. That mean, just as an example, if it was an insurance company, a car insurance company, and I don't want motorcyclists to be one of my type of insurers who let who, who insure their cars, I can't profile out all the motorcyclists and but in that case, you don't need personal data. You can just state I'm not offering motorcycle insurance. Let's say that I prefer not. But you mean a car insurance for people who drive? Uh, yeah, 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 okay. okay. I'm, so they don't declare. So I don't really want any people who insure their cars with me to be motorcyclists because I know those guys or gals will be drive too fast or whatever. So with this kind of concept, I'm not allowed to take a filter out anyone who's a motorcycle. You can't use only uh, these, these automated, automated processing. So if in addition to that, you add human, uh, human evaluation, this principle does not apply. There might be different uh, principles, huh? but this one does not apply because, and that's why it's very narrow. Huh? It was a big debate uh, 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 with the adoption of the GDPR. It's very narrow. So it's only a decision based solely on the automated processing. So certainly for the moment, when you combine with different, uh, with different data and there's a human decision, actually it's fine. So, so now this is kind of toothless. I can say I've had someone looking at profiles and a human there, so I'm not. I can imagine that um, job applications for very big companies, there's a first selection that is uh, that is done. 
I can imagine that it, uh, that it can apply to that type of processes. Can I ima uh, imagine as well that it applies to um, declining in, in financial worlds when there's a fraud that's detected on an, in an automated way and an automated decline of a payment, for example, because there's a suspicion of fraud, th that might, uh, might apply there as well. But it's, it's of course, the, the application is narrower than if it were, if it didn't have the solely. That's, that's for sure. You can still escape the prohibition if, again, the profiling is, uh, is, is necessary for the conclusion of a contract, if it's authorized by law or if you have explicit consent, but you have to give additional uh, safeguards. So you have to safeguard the rights of the person, the freedom of the, the, the freedoms, the right to and freedoms of the person. So for example, uh, freedom of enterprise, freedom of, um, of uh, information, etc. The interests of the data subject need to be taken into account. And at least should there be the possibility for the person to get a human intervention. So, okay, fine, I've been profiled. I, my, my bank uh, has declined my payment, but I want a second opinion by a human so I can defend my position. Yes, I was really in Poland, even though I was in China yesterday, so this is, it's, it's really me. Uh, I need you to process my payment. I, have the, I need to have the right to contest. Yet, no decisions can be, uh, can be based on sensitive data in order to come to uh, prohibited discrimination. Yeah. It depends which authorities. It depends on which authorities, because, for example, criminal justice will not the GDPR will not apply to the criminal uh, criminal administrations, but like tax administration will be bound by this. So that means that they should comply with GDPR. Public public administrations, as a matter of principle, yes. So, so for example, what do you mean? You're not, sir. You're not sure? No, it doesn't. No, no. They have a, they have a separate uh, instrument. You're right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But the national authorities are bound, not the uh, but not uh, the criminal the criminal authorities. They have a separate instrument. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Another concrete example. So uh, the Belgian tax authorities can't take. All the owners of Ferraris in Belgium and go specifically target them or something? Or because they're, they're making a decision on an automatic one variable profiles. But I don't think that Belgian tax administration is uh, advanced up to that point that they will have automated decisions fully automated decisions. I think that it might indeed be one of the, like swimming pools, huh? the, the, the swimming pools, that might be one a good target for controls, for example. Yacht registrations, yeah. Some authorities, I know Switzerland does this, they, they have a list of everyone who owns a private plane, everyone who owns a private car, and they just have yeah. a and they go straight to, you know, auditing those people on a certain rhythm. Yeah, yeah. But that's not really allowed it is allowed if it's not the only criterion, or if they provide a law. And in, 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 in Belgium, for example, there is a law that, that well, provides a legal framework for some types of profiling. But I really don't think that they are fully automated at this point. I don't think so. I don't think this is a, it's, it's a point for public administrations at this point. But there's, if you need to know more about this, there's uh, guidelines from the Article 29 Working Party uh, where you get more examples and more uh, guidelines. So, knowing when GDPR applies, knowing which principles to apply, which legal basis to provide, next question is, how do we do this? First, whenever you're developing your um, your solution, your, uh, your uh, yeah, software. Um, don't assume that you can escape the GDPR. So assume that personal data are 
are uh, processed somewhere. The definitions are very, very large, both for personal data and for processing. The definitions are very large, so it's very, very difficult for you to escape the application of GDPR. So just assume that you're coming within the scope of application. First, for the collecting. What are your sources? Do you collect the data straight from the data subjects themselves, or do you get the data still from a different person? If you collect the data from the data subjects, you know GDPR applies. If you get it from uh, third party, get a data broker, for example, you will need to make additional verifications, but probably GDPR will apply. But you need to know which kind of data you are processing, uh, if it's non-personal data or personal data, which types of data, etc. you need to know. When you're analyzing the data, are you, are you doing this to make statistics? Are you doing this to make a model in order to refine your concepts, for example? Because we've seen in the GDPR there are several exceptions or um, well, the, the obligations are a bit lighter if you can demonstrate that you're actually processing for statistical purposes. This might help you just to create your model, your data model will not uh, help you for the next step, which is the application of your profile to the data that you have in your database. Question there, is your profiling and your application of your model to uh, a data set, is it automated? Does it have an impact on the data subject, yes or no? If this is the case, you have to apply additional guarantees as we've just uh, seen. All of these questions you need to ask while you're developing your solution, also when, when you're uh, conceiving how it's going to uh, function. You need to define all the purposes, so use your imagination, think of all the possible uses that you will be able to make of the personal data that you've collected. First processing, further processing, everything that you can imagine, and you need to apply the data processing uh, principles knowing that there's a lot of bottlenecks that we've discussed before. Then you need to define your legal basis. Most likely you will have some kind of recourse to the legitimate interest. I'm developing a new uh, solution. I'm going to commercialize a solution that will be useful for companies, for uh, persons. I have a legitimate interest and third parties have legitimate interest. But I have to verify that the acts of data processing that I'm performing are not disproportionate to the uh, le uh, legitimate interests or the, the, the interests and the freedoms and the rights of the data subject. And then perhaps, if possible, you can acquire consent for the, from the, the data subject. So that should be your starting point. If you already have a solution or if you're developing a new solution and you're going to be profiling persons, you're very likely to be under an obligation to perform a data, uh, a, data, a data protection impact assessment, meaning that you have to go through well, the questions that we've, that we've been talking about uh, up until now. You have to go through these questions in a very systematic way, and you need to document the answers to all of these questions. So am I going to process the personal data in a new way? What is going to be the impact on the person? What is the nature, what is the scope and the context, the purposes of the processing? Is there a high risk for the person? Then you need to proceed to this impact assessment. Meaning that um, you have to document that you've actually asked yourself a bunch of questions, that you've cons you consider that there's still a balance between what you want to do and the risk for the, the data subject. And if there's an imbalance, or if the impact on the data subject is too big, you need to be able to demonstrate that you've taken remedies, you've provided remedies in order to redress that balance, in order to, to, uh, to, to write that balance. So for example, data, uh, an impact assessment is required when you're going to be profiling a person, that's the first, uh, the first case. Second case is when you're going to be processing sensitive data on a large scale or 
data relating to uh, criminal convictions, and systematic monitoring of a public accessible uh, area on a large scale. So very specific cases in which the uh, impact assessment is mandatory. You can't do anything else. However, keep in mind, whenever there is a potential high risk to the risks and freedoms of natural persons, you also have to do this. Yeah. So in these three cases, in any case, you have to do it, but in any other case where there's a high risk, you have to do it as well. So that's more of an open category. Yeah? So what does this mean, this uh, data protection uh, impact assessment? You have to describe the processing operations, the purposes, the legitimate interests uh, that a controller has. You have to um, assess the proportionality of the, 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 the processing, etc. So the entire exercise or the questions that you need to ask, you need to go through this and you need to, uh, you need to document this. And take a look, if you, if you will, at this uh, website, which is a reference to the website of the CNIL, which is the National uh, Data Protection <laughs> Authority of France. They have made available a tool to do these impact assessments, and it's open source. So you can use it, and you can, uh, you can use it within your companies in order to make sure that everybody who deals with these, uh, with these data, who's involved in the development of new solutions that might have an impact on the lives of, uh, of um, data subjects, that they go through these steps. It's for free, so take a look and, uh, and try to use it. Another principle knowing all these principles uh, that are uh, well, mandatory for any type of data processing, GDPR has come up with new obligations to keep all these principles in mind when you're designing your solution. Yeah? So when you're developing a new solution, a new data analysis tool, for example, or um, some kind of new process within your company, so it's not necessarily an IT or a full IT uh, uh, solution, but even just processes, organizational processes. Whenever you're coming up with new types of, of things, you need to keep in mind the data and the way the data are going to be used. And if possible, all the principles that we've seen before, so data minimization, the purposes, etc., they need to be written into the code of your processes or your solution. So already from the start, from the conception of your, uh, your solutions, you need to be thinking of uh, the data, data protection principles. So of course, you need to be able to demonstrate this, again, that you've thought about everything, and depending on the state of the art, the cost, etc., you need to be able to justify. So of course, it's, if it's super expensive, and actually you're just um, designing an application for the, the football club of your kid, of course, they're not going to expect you to, to meet the highest levels of uh, data protection by design, and it might be sufficient for you just to have uh, security, to, to meet the security norms. But if you are a professional company, if you're going to be uh, commercializing uh, your solution, you really need to take this seriously. Um, What's important here? Well, for example, um, security measures is one of the examples of data protection by design. Um, the fact that at some point your solution asks, do you still need these data? For example, you have uh, an accounting, uh, accounting uh, solution. Um, invoices can be destroyed after, I don't know, seven years or 10 years, I'm not sure. Um, once you've found the legal term during which you've, you, you're, you're obliged to keep uh, the information, but after this term, actually your system could raise a pop-up, ask, do you, still, do you want to delete this because your term is passed? And then you can decide, yes, sure, I don't need this information anymore. I don't need, I don't no need the obligation to keep this information anymore, I can delete. Or no, actually, I'm uh, in uh, litigation about this invoice, so I need to keep all of this, and I have justification for keeping all of this. Um, meaning that when you're developing a new solution, you need to interact with business people, with the technical people, with management, all the people who 
are going to be involved in using the tool might be or should be involved in the creation of uh, of the tool so they can provide their input and they can actually say I need the data because um, because for, for these purposes uh, it's useful for me to have the data for that uh, for that long because there's this legal obligation for example so in that sense it's very good to, to work in uh, interactive uh, um, in interdisciplinary teams just to talk about this and not have the technical people uh, determine the, um, the design alone in addition to the data protection by design, you need to express in the design of the, the tools or the processes, data protection by default, meaning that you can only use the data for a specific purpose and again, move to the more protective side of the, the question. So for example, don't ask for data, like if you're making a form, don't ask for data that you don't need. When you're designing uh, a, a solution where different options can be clicked, actually by default, whereas now by default you will always have the least data or privacy sensitive uh, solution, the, data, the, the principle of data protection by default will oblige the controller to tick the boxes that provide most uh, most uh, protection. So for example, if there is an option to acquire, to be subscribed to, um, to a newsletter, often, in the past, the box was already pre-ticked, yeah? Now it should be the other way around. So the default position should be more protection, yeah? And all of this needs to be documented. So in all of your companies, you should have some kind of file documenting how a solution was designed, who was involved, which were the questions that were asked, and how you've come to the solution in the design that it has in the end. Keep in mind the fairness and the transparency. We've, been, uh, we've talked about this for uh, a, a little while. Um, ask yourself, what is the impact of the processing? There's a difference between processing personal data just in order to serve ads that are more appropriate to a person's interests or to differentiate the treatment of a person. So you can use data in order to sell a new car. You can also use data for, to propose different types of cars. But you can also use data in order to deny uh, an insurance uh, contract or to provide a uh, contract at higher, um, higher uh, prices, for example. Keep in, to keep in mind the legitimate expectations of the data subjects. And this is a, an important point. When you're designing, when you're processing the data, you always have to ask yourself what are the legitimate expectations of a person. This will be different when you're, when you're using or you're offering a loyalty card because if I go to my supermarket and I give my card in order to scan my, my purchases, I know that my data will be used, that I will be analyzed, and that I will receive certain vouchers. I know this. So legitimate expectations is for me, I know that my data will be used. By contrast, if I register in a social media service and um, perhaps I, I fill in a quiz in order to determine my personality, I just think that I'm going to know more about my personality. I do not know that this information will be used in order to influence political campaigns. So there, the legitimate expectations is way off of what, uh, how the, the data have actually been used. So this is an important point that the judges will take into account. In tr terms of transparency, prior information will help. Huh? Of course, uh, if, again, on Facebook, um, I can fill in a personality test that is offered by a third party, and this third party gives me information about the fact that my data will be used uh, for influencing political campaigns, but I can't say that I didn't know. So my legitimate, legitimate expectation is in line with the actual processing of, uh, of information. So if you're designing, again, your, uh, your tool, then keep in mind that you can use these tools to provide little bits of information about the way the, info, uh, the information, the data will be processed. And then as well, we need to keep in touch as well with how people 
see personal data, how people feel about personal data. So my generation is quite sensitive to the, the, the processing of personal data. We don't like to be profiled. But my students, for example, don't care so much. They don't look for information, generally speaking. Huh? Might be a generation, generational thing. Maybe it's just in this phase of their lives that they don't think it's so important. Maybe they will find it more important once they hit 30 or 40. Maybe it's just a thing that will continue to be like this. So this is something as well that will determine these legitimate expectations. And then the information as well provides sufficient uh, information in an understandable form. Finally, data quality. Data quality, the, well, the, the information needs to be accurate and it needs to be up to date. And this, of course, raises the question of algorithmic accountability. Huh? We're generating a lot of uh, information. Some, there might be a, a particular outcome. You need to be able to uh, justify the logic and uh, avoid all these, uh, these the, well, discrimination, for example. So, we already talked about the, the problem of perpetuating uh, existing uh, discriminations. And ideally, you go into, you provide certain processes in order to avoid these, uh, these discriminations and provide uh, certain uh, well, mechanisms in order to actively go and detect. So for example, um, you might have third party audits on, uh, on algorithms and data sets, <coughs> try to make this as transparent as possible and ask this as well if you're working with other providers, ask for the possibility to audit, um, to audit uh, the algorithms and the data sets. If there's inaccurate predictions, then we have a problem of, uh, of data quality. People qualify me as a reckless person, whereas actually I'm a very conservative person, I'm a very cautious person. Well, I'm entitled, I should be entitled to make certain corrections. So, for example, in, uh, in, in a client space, oh my goodness. It's true. Um, in a client space or a user space, it might be possible to actually show how a person has been profiled and to allow the person to make certain corrections if they feel that they have been qualified in an incorrect way. But here, this is absolutely open, uh, open field still. And there's a lot of creativity that can still come out uh, in, these, uh, in these things. Now, Regardless of whether or not we're talking about big data, data subjects have a number of rights. And the first right is to be informed, both at the moment of the collection of the data and throughout the processing of the data. So I'm entitled as a data subject to know who is going to take responsibility for the data processing. Why are my data being processed? For which purposes are they being processed? Which data? How are they being processed? Or which acts of processing? Or processing? If I got the data not from the, from the data subject themselves, but from a third party, I'm entitled to know which is the source of, uh, of, of the, the data. I'm entitled to know who's going to have access to the data, who's going to receive the data. Uh, the fact that I'm uh, entitled to rectification if there's wrong data. There's a whole list in the GDPR, there's a whole list of all the information that needs to be provided at the, 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 at the, the collecting, collecting of the personal data and throughout the processing of, of personal data. So take a look at this uh, in, in Article 13 uh, throughout uh, 15 and well, make sure that your uh, privacy policies comply with these uh, requirements. This is very important as well. When you're developing your solutions, um, keep in mind that um, data subject is always entitled to ask for a copy of the data. When you're gathering a data, when you're developing a solution, when you're using solutions, when you start gathering data, make sure that you have your data management in order. You need to know which data you have about which person and where they are stored. Because a person at any mo point in time can ask for a copy of the data. Meaning that I send you a request 
to send me a copy of all my data, you need to be able to provide me a copy of my data within at most three months. So if at that moment you have to start looking for, okay, I, I don't know, okay, this is an employee, meaning that probably there's some stuff at, in salaries, there might be some stuff in um, the party committee. If you have to start you looking for this data at, that, uh, at the moment of the request, it might become very tight and you might be, uh, you might be uh, too late in asking this data. So, I'm giving the data, I'm sorry. Um, so, when you're designing the data structures within your company, you need to bear in mind that this is a, a right that people can exercise. Yeah. Uh, but the consequence of what you just said is that the companies need to orient the whole data structure to be completely identifiable by person. Right? No, but it, it's nothing you said. Someone used to work in salary, then as an employee, they also would be. So you have to basically create a data structure that is all tied to the individual. That's, that's what the consequence of that is, right? You can't. It doesn't mean that you have to create additional databases eh, in which all these data are, are gathered. No. It just needs, you, you need to know who to ask when a person is asking to exercise their rights. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it requires a bit of work, huh? Yeah. It's a, it's a challenge. You have the, the, what we call the data register, which is what I've been doing for two years, mm -hmm. where if you're a big company like Physically and Apple, you have potentially, have, I guess, hundreds of thousands of users in the future, then you need to create this data register mm -hmm. because then you know exactly like, where is the data, how it is processed. And so then you have templates to help you. Yeah, but then you, are, you just know where to lo localize the data. You don't have the copies of the data yet, huh? No. But so your register is not a huge database. But you already know where to look, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's the minimum. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Isn't some data sort of confidential in the company's IP? Why? Yeah, there might be a conflict. At some points, there might be a conflict between what you're asking yeah. uh, and 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 uh, IP or confidential uh, confidential data. Absolutely. But at that point, that's for you to justify. So GDPR is not absolute. It doesn't say personal data protection is always superior to the protection of an intellectual property or, or confidential information. But it means that at some point when the person asks, you need to, all the non-confidential information you need to provide. And if there is confidential information, you need to be able to justify why you consider that your interest is superior to the person's interest. Um, it can be almost impossible to, uh, to respond. True. You can't, you're not, you're never held to an impossible obligation. And if you can demonstrate that it's impossible, then you're not under the obligation. But it needs to be, it can't be just an excuse to uh, to send away the, the person. No? Theoretically, you must give this data, but in some circumstances... If it's an obligation to re-identify, it's better for the person not to be identified anymore. So, <coughs> it's, again, it's, it's a matter of balance. So again, here, there's some room for creativity because, well, as you see, there's, it's not clear yet how we're going to be dealing with this in, uh, in, in, in practice. Huh? Um, so perhaps there's a developing field of legal design um, where a lot of applications are, are uh, arising now in, in the field of, uh, of data protection. For example, in everything that's relating to um, information, the right of information. People don't want to be reading five pages of data protection policy. They're not interested, they don't want to know. So companies are starting to think about icons, how are, uh, how are data used, about small videos perhaps, about uh, shorter texts, uh, text communicating in different levels. Perhaps also just as you go through a website, of orderings, for example, ordering, uh, ordering uh, a product online, you might get bits of information as you go along. Careful, if you fill in this, this could mean this and this and this, for example. So this is a field that is, that is developing right now. 
how, uh, how can this be done? Which visual, right, well, all these visualization tools as well might be used with some simulating, um, for example, for children as well. If you want to communicate with children and, and how uh, the data of children are going to be used, this is something where a lot of creativity can be, uh, can be displayed as well. Then, um, the person has the right to rectification and erasure. In case there's inaccurate data, person is entitled to rectification. Seems fairly straightforward. But this right to erasure, this is a bit more nuanced than what people are led to believe in many cases. This right to be forgotten, it can only apply in limited cases. So it's not because I tell you I want to be forgotten that you are under the obligation to erase all your data. By contrast, it is the, the, the case, for example, when I withdraw my consent if the data are no, no longer necessary, etc. But go and consult the, the, the GDPR if a person asks you to, uh, to be forgotten, so if, if they're exercising their right to be forgotten. It's not an absolute right, okay? Then there's a the right to object, particularly interesting in the case of uh, profiling, processing on uh, public interest and uh, legitimate interest grounds. When I am processing personal data on the basis of my legitimate interests, a data subject can always come and object against uh, her personal data being processed if she can invoke particular circumstances well, tied to her particular situation that uh, justify not processing her personal data. Then again, a controller, even if a, personal, uh, a, a person has demonstrated I have particular reasons to oppose against my, uh, the process against my personal data, even then a controller may still say, well, but I find that my legitimate grants are superseding your interest. So there's this dialogue between the data subject at that point and the controller on whose rights are more worthy of protection and in, in, in a sense. Of course, ultimately, the courts will decide. You're entitled to object to uh, direct marketing and at some point as well to processing for scientific, historical research and statistical purposes. But again, go look into the GDPR and the particular text that might apply. Just know that this, is, uh, that this exists as well, the restricting of uh, processing data portability and this automated uh, individual decisions, uh, including profiling, we've talked about this before, as it's right not to be subject and uh, in, in uh, particular cases to ask for uh, human in intervention. So in relation to automated decisions. What is difficult? Where do we find relevant provisions in the GDPR? We have the right of information. So if any automated decision are uh, provided in your big data solution, you need, to, uh, you need to inform the persons about it and you need to explain the logic uh, of, the, of, of the profiling as well. Here again, might be uh, in conflict with your IP, you might not want to give too many details about your, uh, your big data solution because there might be interesting information for your competitors as well. You need to uh, take into account this right of access. We talked about this. Right of rectification might be difficult in case of big data, uh, the big data solutions. Um, you have the right to rectify the outcome of, uh, of, of, of profiling, perhaps, maybe yes, maybe no. The right to uh, erasure, uh, erasure if your uh, processing is based on consent, and right to object in uh, the case of legitimate interest. But then again, you have to make this balancing exercise. Huh? Then, as a conclusion, I think almost a conclusion, um, it's a moving target, it's difficult to be doing big data uh, and, and uh, data analysis in the context of the GDPR. There's many, many rules that might make it more difficult for you to be providing these types of, uh, of services. Where you can anonymize the data. If it's possible for you to work on completely anonymous data, please do so. If this is not possible, pseudonymization can be a valid uh, alternative. 
course, if you want to go and apply the profiles, that's a different matter, then this will not be an option. But all the, 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 the processes preceding this, if it's possible not to use on actual data, then limit the risk and try to work on non, uh, well, not immediately recognizable data. Take into account these principles of data protection by design and by default, and think about the design of your solutions all the time. Think about the impact of the data protection principles on the design of your, of your solutions all the time. Consult with an impact assessment uh, just in order to see where, where are you, wh how well are you scoring with your, well, with your existing processes, with your new processes, and integrate the GDPR principles and perhaps additional ethical principles uh, in, 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 in your solution. We've seen a lot on ethics and, and AI well, in, in, uh, in the past months, this might be a, a good occasion to go and look into those principles to integrate them in, um, in, your, in your solutions. Check your algorithms and make sure that they're tested. If possible, often it, well, the developers are always the same profiles, they're young men between what, 25 and 45 perhaps, I understand it's difficult to um, have mixed development teams, but perhaps try to compose mixed testing teams. So if the outcomes, if, if you're having a data set uh, and, and you're having a, an, an algorithm, try to use diverse testing teams in which women are represented, people of different ages are represented, people of different minorities are represented because it's important and you can, you can avoid a lot of disasters and public relations disasters more notably. Try to communicate more transparently in your privacy notices, so try to communicate on uh, the way the data are used and document all your choices. Huh? So if you're having discussions with your colleagues, try to make a short document making a summary about all the points that have been discussed and try to put that in your data protection file. My uh, opinion, there's opportunities here as well. And so I had a discussion about algorithmic transparency. It's a beautiful discussion. It's a very difficult discussion because, well, people have to take position and people well, are often touched in their very intimate, uh, in their very intimate uh, sphere. But it gives you an opportunity to work with uh, a diversity of people and perhaps to provide audits. So if there is if you have the possibility, then uh, in your contracts with your third parties as well, with your suppliers, make sure that the algorithmic transparency is one of the po uh, one of the issues that you can audit. And the contracts that you're concluding with for your company, with um, for your company or for your clients, with uh, with suppliers, make sure that you have the right to audit the transparency, giving all the guarantees in terms of confidentiality, etc. But make sure that you can have uh, a look at that uh, at that stuff. And then be innovative in your communications. Huh? And try to involve your communication team, your marketing team, etc. And try to think of these things together. Different possibilities, as we uh, already discussed, small uh, icons, perhaps uh, small videos, use uh, easily accessible text, um, give access to profiles, perhaps, and, and uh, check, make people check the outcome of uh, the profiling exercises. For consent as well, to the extent that this applies to big data uh, solutions, try to work with granular consent. So you don't have one consent form in which it's an all or nothing uh, question, if it's yes or no, but try to make sure that, like for so, so some uh, websites do that for cookies. I accept these type of cookies, but I don't accept this, these types of cookies. You can try to do this the same with your uh, big data applications. And I think we've made it. Thank you very much. And if there's any questions, uh, welcome to discuss. Thank you. Unmute.